The world is kind of a mess right now, and it's very concerning, and, um, and I'm going to be honest with you, I've, I've been in, I grew up in a church, I've been in, in ministry uh, now 39 years, all of it right here in Oklahoma City, 35 of those uh, as, your, as your leader. We've talked a lot about this subject, and I'm tired of talking. I'm really tired of talking about it. Now we're gonna to have to have conversations, important ones. We've gotta keep at least owning it. I'm ready for some action. And this is not a one and done Sunday. What we're doing today was totally, is totally different than what we thought we'd be doing when, this, when I gave some thought to this series and it all changed about 10 days ago. And I've been saying to people, over time, don't hear what I say, watch what I do. And God is answering our prayers in this whole realm of bringing us to be a church that is not just white faces. And I'm so thankful for that, but we have a lot more to do. In 2 Corinthians chapter five, it says that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, no longer counting people's sins against them. He gave us this wonderful message. So we are Christ's ambassadors. God is making his appeal through us. And it says he has given us the task of reconciling others. Amen. It's a task. Yes, it's talk, but it's a task. We have come to a moment where we'd better take that task word more serious than we ever have. So we're gonna spend a lot of time on it this summer, this month. We're gonna start with a man that's been a friend of my family, my dad and mom for 50, over 50 years. And God blessed me with his friendship uh, many years ago when I turned to him for advice and he became a key part of my life. He is one of our elders. I want you to know he sits on our board of elders. He meets with us every month. And uh, his, his advice and his wisdom has been just hard to even put into words what he means to me and to this church. I wish he could be with us in person, but uh, he was not able to get here. Uh, Joyce was in the hospital on Tuesday, and so we had to do this over a uh, video, so, but it's still just as good. So anyway, I want to take you now to a conversation I had with Dr. Ron Fowler earlier this week, and he'll probably hear this, so let's welcome Dr. Ron Fowler to our church. Dr. Fowler, I'm, I'm just so thankful that uh, you're with us, and uh, it means a lot to me that you, you would take your time and, and help us right now. These are uh, unprecedented times, uh, and probably three, four weeks ago, we thought when we said unprecedented times, we were referring to the COVID-19 virus, and yet they've become even more complicated, and in my, in my book, more troublesome um, with, with the issue that is taking place around our cities and the unrest we have in our cities, all because um, we have, still have problems knowing how to treat each other, how, how to respond to each other. Um, you know, in the Second Corinthians 5.18 says that God has given us the task of reconciling people to him. It's a task he's given us it's not an option. It's not something that we're allowed to say, well, if I get around to it. And I think there's never been a moment for, for me, for our church, frankly, uh, that we need to take this task very serious, more than we ever have. We've, and we've been doing our best, I think, but now we don't know what to do next in many ways. So I, I wanted your input, uh, some practical things that you think we can do as a church and as individuals to, to at least in our own community bring the healing and uh, truly be that light on, on the shining light on the hill for the love of Christ. So speak to us. I know you've, you've helped many, many people through these scenarios. So uh, I'm so thankful we could turn to you today. Uh, Marty, I am so grateful for you and the ministry of the church there in Oklahoma and uh, the job that God is enabling you to do is 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 remarkable you know we we share uh, so many things in common but one of the things we share in common is that we we have a marvelous heritage 
a heritage of faith, a heritage of inclusion, a heritage of people uh, who would not claim to be perfect, but they were dead set on becoming uh, better than what they were. And, um, and I'm very thankful for that, that heritage. I think of your dad and your mom and, and the church there in, um, in Dayton, Ohio. And, and now to see how God is using you in Oklahoma City is just simply amazing. And, um, and you're surrounded with some amazing people there. Um, some of my dearest, dearest friends. But that's part of our heritage and how grateful I am for it. the events that happened there in Minneapolis has sounded a, a, a cry and call that has reached all of us. In fact, I call it a visceral moment, uh, a moment that gets in your gut and yeah. uh, and causes you to feel, you know, both sadness on the one hand and, and yet uh, a degree of excitement on the other. And, and I think that's where I am. I'm between sadness and, um, and excitement, uh, between mourning and, uh, and yet dancing. Uh, because wherever there is a problem, we know God has a unique way of creating a marvelous opportunity for people to benefit from what they experience and, uh, and transform it into social actions that result in God being honored and people being helped. And, uh, and I think that's what we, we all want to do, you know, is to yeah. honor God and uh, help people. And nobody does that better than the crossings. And, uh, and so I'm just delighted to be a part of that family. Uh, there, there are a few practical things, you know, that, um, that I think we, we, can, we can benefit from. As we looked at what happened, what, what happened there in, in Minneapolis to one of its, one of its citizens. And, um, and if, you know, if, if you don't mind, I'd like to share with you a, a couple of those practical things, because I think, I think good people are always trying to figure out how can I make a difference, you know, yeah. and, uh, and how can I do my part as small as that might be to, to make a difference in what is happening uh, in the world. And, uh, and the more I thought about that, uh, the, the more I became so totally convinced that this visceral moment, moment of sadness uh, on the one hand and, 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 and a feeling of some pain, you know, um, as, as, a, as one man is, is trying to do his job and, uh, and yet uh, from all evidence, he may have gone too far. You know, and then there's another man, you know, who's crying out for help and uh, he makes an appeal, you know, to those around him first, I can't breathe. And then um, when he realizes that plea is not being responded to well, he widens the circle and uh, it makes an appeal to a source that he believes would, would certainly respond and he, he calls his mother. And, uh, and, and I think at that, at that point, I kind of lost it. You know, I was watching it and that got inside of me. And, uh, and I found myself saying, God, there's got to be an exodus for our nation. There's got to be a way out, a way to a better place, a way to the realization of what makes this nation so great. And, um, and that is, how can we expand, you know, on the pursuit of life, liberty, and, and happiness? And, uh, and I thought about just a few practical things we might do, and then you might want to, you know, amplify that or ask me any additional questions. I'll be glad to respond to that. I think, number one, you know, the, the first practical thing I think we can do is to reaffirm our commitment to doing small acts of kindness. Um, what, the, what, what George Ford uh, uh, requested was uh, 
let me breathe. It was, it was a small request, really. And, uh, and uh, it's, it's too bad that it went unanswered. And, uh, but, but yet the world isn't asking us to move all mountains every day. They're just asking us for an act of kindness. And as Christians, I think that goes to our whole purpose for, for why God has uh, given us this marvelous act of redemption, um, given us this grace that we could never earn. And um, through small acts of kindness, he has blessed us and enabled us to be where we are and to do what we what we could do to partner with him in the acts of redemption. Um, small acts of kindness. It, it's, it's still been the number one thing that moves the world forward. People caring for each other. People thinking of each other. Um, somebody calling a friend and um, who was in distress and uh, just saying, let me pray, pray for you. We, we dare not give up as Christians on the power of prayer to bring about divine intervention into our human situations. Yeah, small acts of kindness because God cares. Uh, I was reading over in um, Exodus chapter 3. Uh, where it says a new king has come to the to the throne and who uh, knew not Joseph, and um, and unfortunately he was not emotionally well developed, and uh, because instead of hearing the cry of the people, you know he in, he decided he made a he made a judicial decision to make their lives worse, but the but the wonder of that whole uh, episode is that the scriptures tell us, but God heard the cry of the people and responded to it. Um, great movements have always had their genesis in, in answering a cry, um, as small as that might be. A, um, in fact, the more I thought about it, a, 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 a great cry from a person in distress has always been the catalyst for the dawning of a new day. Somebody crying out, God hearing that cry and responding to it, uh, set in motion um, a, a, a whole new saga that, that represents moving people and life forward to the dawning of a better day. That's, that's kind of how I think we are, Pastor. I think the cry of this one man, George Floyd, um, uh, has set in motion um, what I see as the building blocks of a new day, people coming together and, and saying, this has to end. Um, when I looked at the screen at the protest, at, at, at first I thought, oh, wow, that, you know, that, that's a lot of people. But then when I saw how many young people were there and whites outnumbering blacks in, in many of those marches, I thought, oh, my good, could this be the catalyst for the dawning of a new day? If only that crowd, you know, could realize the power there is in small acts of kindness, neighbors caring about each other, uh, good Samaritans stopping to do what they could do for a person in distress. Individuals seeing people, you know, who are in great pain and just reminding them I want to pray for you, and uh, and I'm trusting whatever the need is, God will answer it in your life. Just small things. But God has a way of using small things to do great things, to do greater things. And, uh, and I think believers who want to make a difference 
might do well by just starting by saying, what can I do? And it just may be prayer. And uh, it's a small thing, but when a thousand people are praying together, that's power. And, uh, and it has the power and ability to move a mountain. And Second Chronicles tells us, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray, ah, great things can happen. God can partner with them in turning, turning things around. That, that's my first thought. You know, as I was looking at the, at the protests going forward, and um, is that um, as, as people commit themselves to doing small things, small acts of kindness, God will multiply the, the impact of that and do something truly great in, in the world. And I think that's the big, that's the dawning of a of a new day. Will there be um, people less developed morally, spiritually, who, with their own agendas, try to co-opt a a, a good intention? Absolutely. Uh, does it pain uh, pain us to see people burning and stealing and breaking, tearing down? And uh, absolutely. There are always those people around who, who want to, for whatever the reason, um, have their moment of, of fame, so to speak. Um, and, 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 and yet that can't stop us from the broader you know, representation that is before us. And that is how many more people are there for good, not for ill, are there to advance, you know, hope and not create panic and despair. And, uh, and we must not allow those who hijacked our good intentions, you know, to deter us from believing that God will work through a people who care deeply about the welfare and the conditions of others. Small acts of kindness. You know, Ron, uh, I couldn't help but think about, a, you, you gave me a sentence a few weeks ago uh, in fact, I think you said it to the whole board of elders in our last meeting. This one, I, I, have, I have not forgotten. And you made a comment that uh, there are situations where good intentions get hijacked by false assumptions. Yeah, yeah. That's gold. Yeah. And it's that, true. That, 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 is so, that is so true. It, it may even be a part of the police officers you know, dilemma. And um, somewhere along the line, he, he lost it and, um, and, and went too far. And, um, but, but that's the nature of evil. Yeah. yeah. The enemy is always trying to co-opt our acts of kindness and, uh, and twist it in some way, shape or form that is not good. And, yeah. um, and, and yet we, that we must not give up on trusting God to honor, you know, what is done sincerely for the, uh, to honor him and to help and to help people, you know. The, the, the second thing that I thought about is that um, if, if I've learned anything, I've learned that part of what is needed for the dawning of a day in which justice reigns is for a constituency to realize how important it is not only to elect good people to office, people who have an emotional content, uh, people who have a disposition toward compassion and humility, uh, people who are committed to doing you know, what is just and fair, even when they may be dealing with someone who is not very just nor very fair. And, um, but it's the, it's the choosing of good people to place authority in their hands. I think we may have to go back as a nation and take a look, as has been suggested, in terms of what qualities does one need to be a peace keeper. Now, let's, that's what policemen are. They're keepers of the peace. And, uh, and yet we may need to take a look at uh, the extra training that may be necessary 
particularly when people come from an arena of military service where they are trained to kill and they come into the social arena in which they're trained to be ambassadors of peace. And, uh, and what's, what's necessary to kill is certainly uh, not very useful, you know, uh, when it comes to fulfilling the higher calling of what it means to be a policeman. Uh, I, I think that's something that all of us can become more concerned with, and, and that is uh, making sure we, we vote for good people, but, but making sure our voice gets heard in terms of qualities that are necessary to fulfill the office to which we entrust with great authority. You know, which, which and, and, and while I'm on that point, I think we must never forget that there are many, many more policemen who go about their job every day uh, doing the work of building uh, structures of peace uh, rather than doing what is wrong and injurious, you know, to, to, to others. And, uh, and I, I hope that doesn't get lost as we seek to remove the weak ones and um, that we don't forget about celebrating and offering our thanks for those, you know, who do, do an extremely tough job very, very well. And, um, and I just think that note needs to be sounded as, as well as the other notes that get sounded, you know, in our, in our deliberations. Um, number three, and here's perhaps, uh, Pastor, I think one of the greatest lessons I'm getting from what's going on, that we need to reaffirm our willingness to confront implicit biases, hmm. implicit biases. And uh, I'm talking about biases that operate, you know, at our unconscious level. I'm talking about biases that... Uh, that function with limited uh, information. Uh, I'm thinking about the false assumptions that, uh, that guide a lot of people to say what they say and to do what they do. And, uh, and one of the interesting exercises, you know, I, I went through the other day was taking a look in the Bible at how many times implicit bias was at work in situations. And uh, if we remember what Jesus said from the cross, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. In other words, Jesus was saying, people are crucifying me and castigating me, uh, and they really don't know why they are doing that. What's prompting them to do that is mis misinformation is a lack of understanding, uh, stereotypes, and um, that, that drive them to reject the one who came to deliver them, offer them their, 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 their greatest help. Uh, forgive them for they know not what they do. Implicit bias. Um, uh, Pharaoh, uh, implicit bias. Uh, what does he do? He decides, <laughs> you know, because the Hebrews are becoming more numerous, and uh, and he makes the assumption that if the Hebrews outnumber the Egyptians, they will do what I would do, meaning Pharaoh. And uh, and and Pharaoh, you don't know that um, God has quality qualities uh, of, of people that. Um, that have taken seriously the teachings of Jesus, you know, uh, eye for an eye. No, I say not an eye for an eye, but but let love reign. Let forgiveness operate. There are people who are bigger, you know, than retaliation and vengeance. They don't operate from that level. But if a person has an unconscious bias, uh, they tend to believe that people would respond as they would respond. Not true. There are people who, as one of our leaders used to say, when people go low, we go high. I think there's a lot of truth in that, in, in the need to recognize that I may have attitudes that are not healthy, that are not 
accurate. When I look at the poor, what do I see? When, when, I, when I look at an alcoholic, what do I see? Do I see a person who is still uh, worthy of dignity and respect? Uh, when I look at a person with a different nationality and, uh, or speak a different language, what do I see? And unfortunately, you know, in our, in our nation, you know, so many people have looked at persons who have a different color than them or different language than them. And they have ideas that are not true at all about those people. As one teacher told my, my, my wife early on, she was a, in fact, she was a counselor. She told my wife to forget about going to college because she didn't think she had the aptitude for it. My wife still tells me that. And, uh, and I continue to tell her, you haven't released that yet and forgiven that lady, you know, by now. And, uh, and, and she said, well, I'm thinking about it. And, um, but, but, but it is true, people make judgments that are not true, that wound, that hurt, that scar persons. And, uh, and it is something we all need to become more aware of. It even positions people for failure who could succeed, you know, an implicit uh, bias. One last illustration of that. Israel hears a giant saying, send me a man that I may fight against him. It's Goliath. What's operating at the unconscious level of Goliath? He sees David. And he said, am I a dog that you would send a boy out here? No, his bias allows him to believe that David is unworthy to fight, to, to be a competitor. He misjudges David. David will exceed his expectations. <laughs> and uh, in fact, David is so wise he knows that he cannot do a hand-to-hand -hand combat, and that's what Goliath was looking for. And David comes with a whole new strategy for taking down an adversary. It's throwing a stone. Goliath's greatest weakness was that he allowed his bias to formulate a conclusion in regards to David and, uh, and unfortunately, he lost his life uh, because David, you know, with a slingshot, you know, destroyed him. That's the power, though, of an um, implicit bias, an attitude that operates at the unconscious level because of a prejudice. And uh, it wounds the person and keeps them from positioning themselves to be uh, as, as, as right as they need to be as they look at, at others. And it happens in industry all the time. People get looked over because of some bias. And, uh, and yet that person may possess a great skill, a great ability to be able to help the organization to succeed. Um, what bias do I have? What, 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 what keeps me from broadening my circle you know, of, of, of relationships and uh, what keeps me from taking uh, advantage of the opportunities that, that God places before me and um, the people who think I'm not good enough, people who downgrade themselves because they don't believe that they can, they are smart enough. And, uh, and there are all kinds of biases that limit people's you know, ability to, to realize the opportunities God gives them. We, well, we can confront, we can confront them. And, uh, and, our, and we can free people around us who hear our biases to help us become aware of them and end them. And number four, we can celebrate who we are, the family of God. And um, that knowing that God uh, Acts chapter 17, verse 26, I believe. God is made of one blood, one translation said, of one man. Uh, all nations that dwell on the face of the earth. And, um, but we are, we are connected. Uh, we're connected through the gracious 
the graciousness of God. We're connected through what God has given to all of us. Um, we have more uh, in, in common than can ever divide us, that we are all a part, as we sing so wonderfully well, the family of God. I've been washed in his blood. Absolutely. That's worth celebrating. And we can celebrate it. Uh, the Asian can sing it. The Hispanic can sing it. The African American can sing it. The Italian can sing it. We're, we're all in this same family. God only has one family. And, and thank God, you know, that um, we are connected as kinfolk, you know, <laughs> as brothers and sisters uh, at, at a far deeper level than people who do not know God could ever experience. Uh, that's our power. That's our privilege. And, um, and that's why uh, we must work together to rid our nation of this tarnish, this tarnishing, you know, uh, attitude called racism. And um, so that we might celebrate the bigger gifts uh, that God gives to all of us, membership in in his family. And um, and it, it enables us to uh, kind of hear people who do not think that we're that special. We can hear them. And, um, but we don't have to come down to their level. We don't have to respond to what they say. We can merely reaffirm who we are and, uh, and with pride know that God has blessed us to have this wonderful, wonderful new identity in him that uh, that makes us connect with a family that's far bigger than our biological families. We can celebrate uh, that new identity. Number five, uh, we can reaffirm our commitment to increasing our knowledge of the history and lessons of racial injustice. There are a lot of good books out there. We ought to read some of them. The Color of Compromise is perhaps one of the latest that, that deal with the whole history, you know, of, of race in, in, in our nation. And, um, and, uh, and it makes us more aware, you know, that uh, this thing has been around for far too long. And, and, and it's time we work together to remove all of the barriers that people have erected that divides what God had intended to be united, you know, through faith in, in Christ. And um, um, don't be ignorant regarding the, the, the harm that race has, has done. There's a reason for disparities, you know, that we see now in, in health and in education, you know, and uh, there's a reason for that. And uh, the better enlightenment, enlightening, enlightenment that we, we have, enlightened that we become, what I'm trying to say, um, the, the better we, I think, can help others to become free of, of bigotry and things which demean, you know, the glory, the glory of God and, and, and keeps our nation from um, being uh, able to do what our nation does better than anybody else on the face of this globe. And, uh, and that is give people the tools and the resources to pursue life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. America is still a great nation, and it does that better than any other nation that, that, I, that I know. What can we do? Uh, we can pray for victims of injustice. We can all do that. Injustice hurts. Injustice damages a person's perception of themselves. Injustice undermines the good news. Nobody fought it harder than our Lord. And he's passed the baton on to us. And part of our job is to stand up for justice for all people uh, everywhere, 
that we might become what King called the beloved community. We got to keep praying for strength to do that. The strength to not bow to the small mindedness of others, but, but strength to do God's will with humility and, uh, and recognize that even the person who hates me uh, can have the benefit of knowing I am praying for him or her. I, I choose to um, come down to that level and, um, and, and back away from my obligation, you know, to uphold, you know, the, 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 the will of God. Next, I talked about kindness. We can come alongside of somebody who needs help. And in the name and spirit of Christ, help them. I am terribly convinced that God has a way of bringing people alongside of our lives that we least suspected to do acts of kindness and love. Mm -hmm. and God says when we do that for each other, he has an amazing way of reminding us that he has not forgotten about our acts of kindness and our, our, our willingness to do what we can to be a blessing to other people as we come alongside of them to help them in whatever ways we possibly can. We can trust God um, to help us expand the circle of our friends expand that circle if your circle is only people of your own ethnicity who are your friends it's too small you got to make it bigger you got to trust god to, to let you expand it because you become enriched by their perspectives by their journey by their lives by their understandings uh, by their ministries <clears throat> Your life becomes so much more enriched as the circle of your life uh, becomes expanded to include people of different ethnicities, but of a common devotion, you know, to Christ and um, and his love and, and, and his life. Uh, I believe that. I believe that. Uh, so, so, so much so that my family, I've got brothers and sisters who have different mothers and fathers, and uh, but I am so grateful for them. And uh, they are as dear to me as, as anything. I think as our nation tries to find ways to go forward, nothing could be more important than people who are open, you know, to developing friendships and ties that become part of their family, uh, family in the sense that we care about them, we, we see them periodically, we talk to them, they know that if they need us, we're there for them. And um, I hope all of us could have a, a rainbow, a rainbow family. And um, it would be a blessing to us in ways we have yet to fully understand. You know, you, you always bring so much more uh, to the scenario, to the table than than I think any of us could could have imagined, and we I'm so thankful for you. You know, you were talking about the friendships and 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 broaden the horizons of your fellowship and all that, and it it's pretty powerful, uh, Dr. Fowler, to hear you say that. But I've been privileged to get to watch that, and uh, that's quite an example to me. You know, um, uh, also uh, I think it was about right at the beginning and in, in your first point you made the comment about reaffirming our commitment to do small acts of kindness. And I would love your thoughts, uh, what you're seeing that these days, it seems like even in the body of Christ, we'll do an act of kindness, but we have to make sure first that you see things our way, whether it's politically, even theologically. You know, I watch people uh, say terrible things. I watch uh, Christians and leaders and 
theologians say terrible things about other Christians and leaders and theologians. And I, I wish we could somehow understand how is it we, we are to love and be kind to each other even if we don't agree on things. Yeah. And we don't see things that way. And I think you've demonstrated that in so many ways, uh, even in the city of Akron. Yeah. Um, and so I, I think that's just something that we... I miss in the culture. I hope we can get that back. So um, what would you, if you could say a, uh, a, if you could give us a charge, if you could say the Crossings family here, Crossings, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to commission you to go do this. And if you will go do this, you will become a shining light for all people and for reconciliation in Oklahoma City. Would you... What would you say would be that one question, that one thing you would say to us, at least one, you go do this and you, you'll be surprised at what can happen? If I would tell members of the crawl scenes something, it would be, remember, doctrine drives behavior. What you believe gets translated into how you act. And, uh, and that's why coming to church understanding the word of the Lord, taking to heart the commandments of God, celebrating who God is and, um, and what he intends for all of us, it forms convictions uh, that uh, in time gets translated. They guide us. Um, they, they become the, the road map that carries us from where we are to where God wants us us to be. And um, the, the church is doing that. And um, you, you're, you're not apologetic for what you believe. And, uh, and I celebrate that. And, and yet there is a compassion uh, at the chapel for enabling the next generation, you know, to represent Christ in all the dimensions to which God is going to send them. Um, there, there is the health center, there is the school, there is the, the penitentiary, the ministry throughout the state of Oklahoma in all of the, all of the penitentiaries. My God, what a blessing. <laughs> what, what a tremendous blessing. Um, don't quit on God. Don't give up on God. Keep believing his word and trusting him and, uh, and there are greater things I believe God has in store for this marvelous con congregation. Uh, thank, thanks, Marty, for the, for the gift of family. And my children love you dearly. <laughs> and um, there isn't a time we get together, they don't talk about Pastor, Pastor Gross. And um, in fact, my wife at one point, when she was chastising me about something that uh, I thought she was wrong about and said, you know who I'll call and tell on you if you don't straighten up. And, uh, and I said, don't you dare do it. But they love you dearly as I do. And, um, and I don't know that I have any special commission for this great church. Only You've given it. Keep, keep doing what you're doing. You're yeah. on a great track. And God has used it in, in a marvelous way. Well, you know, you were my dad's brother first. And uh, thank you so much. And uh, you, you have no idea how, how um, deep and how rich and how far-reaching your impact is in this church and therefore the city and the state. So we sure love you and thank you for giving us your time today and for sharing your wisdom and uh, for helping us begin the process to... Be, like never before, have the right conversations, learn some things we need to learn, and then apply those things in a way that will will bless our city as we provide the example that I think the city needs from all of the churches, um, that the color of our skin should not in any way affect how we love and care for each other. And I think we're going to try to get that message loud and clear more than we ever have, and I'm so thankful for your help in that. So Lord bless you. Give Joyce a hug. And uh, I'll see you soon. God bless you, my brother. Give all my love there. We will. <laughs>